Good morning. So it is, I don't remember, the 16th of May, and it's about 5.14 a.m. my time here in New Brunswick. So today I'm giving a little testimony of what has happened with us for the last year or so. Um, the reason why I'm giving this testimony is um, three things. One, a conversation that I had with um, an individual yesterday who is in similar circumstances or almost similar circumstances to myself. And the second one is because of a video by Country Living Aloha that I watched on Sabbath. And the third is a comment my middle son made where he said he thought we were cursed. So I'm making this video for that. The whole purpose of this um, channel is to encourage uh, single mothers who, you know, are desiring to go into the country and everything. I have felt less than encouraged over the last year. So to begin, I just pray that only God will be seen and heard and whatever is said will make sense to the hearer and will be to God's glory. Amen. So what happened was that last year, this time, we had the grand idea that we wanted to get out of debt with all that we were seeing around us and that we would purchase property and build a little tiny home and go off grid, start a garden and see how we could make ends meet from that. We were introduced to a couple who said that they would help us. Now, I want to say in sharing that this is about the experience and not about the people. The days of worrying about what people have done or will do have passed for myself. And I'll share seven things that I've learned from this experience. So the experience was that the individual, you know, they said, oh, you're a single mom and you have two boys and you're trying to do God's thing and we're going to help you. Now, just for a little background, I grew up in Jamaica and I grew up in a home where we didn't have much. But even though we didn't have much, our mother did not allow us to beg, borrow or steal and let me tell you, she didn't tell us. She did all measures to ensure that we didn't do those things. And that was it. There were times when we didn't have some of the things that would have made life convenient. But we never missed out on food. We were all very well fed. Very, very well fed. So I grew up desiring never to be in debt. So prior to coming to Canada, I had no debt with the exception of a car that I had bought shot before I left which had been after years of people trying to convince me, you're with the bank, you're only paying 1% interest, and if you buy it, you have the car, if anything, to return. You know, you could sell the car and make back the money to pay it off. So it was like two or three years of, you know, individuals persuading or trying to persuade me that led me to purchase that car before um, things worked out that I ended up in Canada. So debt is something that I have avoided like the plague. Fast forward, I come here in 20, in 2008. I have no debt with the exception of my um, student loan because I started university uh, in Manitoba. I did my degree there. And that was like minimal at best because Manitoba really has um, like a good, um, what would you call it now? In terms of the student loan, um, repayments, you get more grants as a single individual with a child than I guess all they would do for somebody else as well as I was also working. So I mostly use the grants and the loan portion. I left it in my account with the intent that once I finished, if I didn't need it during the course of the study, because that was the purpose of it. I wasn't going to use it to buy a house or do anything. I would just pay off that portion of the loan and then just have whatever little was left. However, I then got married, moved to Ontario, 
which made that loan haunt me until 2020 when I finally ended up paying it all off. So that is how my mindset is. I do not like to owe anyone. The Bible says, owe no man anything but to love them. So I try my best not to beg, borrow, or steal. If I ask you for something, it may be a plant cutting or something. That is it. So these individuals told me that they would help. Now, when they told me that they would help, I was very grateful because at this point, I was becoming a little weary with the whole process and, you know, just the concern with the mounting debt because the expectation had been that when we came here, we had come here with like $27,000 debt. And the idea was, and coming here, I would have stopped paying over $1,500 in living expenses that I've been paying in Ontario. So I didn't have the rent anymore. I didn't have the water bill. I didn't have as um, big an electricity bill. And I would have a few other bills that were associated with us being in where I was before. So I would just put that money directly on the line of credit, as well as the kid's dad was supposed to be sending money for them. So I put that directly on the line of credit. But we come to New Brunswick. I start getting less classes. So that cuts that, literally slashes that to almost a third of what I was getting. Their dad is no longer giving what he would normally give or not giving any at all. And again, that's no judgment on anybody because as we go along in this, I hope you recognize that. All of this is a praise and not a beat down. And then, of course, um, other expenses come up with the house, as I said in the previous uh, testimony. So now back to last year this time, last year May. So having had all of those experiences and seeing that I'm not making headway, short of putting the children into school and going back to work in you know the regular scheme of things, I'm not likely to get out of this in a quick fashion. So the intent was to sell the house, get whatever we could get, pay off our debt, which by this time had moved from 27000 to almost 37000 dollars and then purchase the land, da, da 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 Now, I have tried building two cat houses and um, two sheds, both of which I would not put up for sale. They're an embarrassment. But my cats did like them. So, yeah. So, I can't build a house. So, prior to going to these people's place, because what ended up happening was we were able to get a, um, a buyer. And then the idea was that we would go and be at their property because their property was right next to ours. And we would have their help in clearing the property and putting up the building. In exchange for that, I would have offered my services to them because I didn't have money, which I made quite clear. I did not have money to pay them, but they're older people, which means, and they also had stated that they had some health issues that you know made it harder for them to do their gardening and stuff. So I said, sure, we would help with the garden as well as we would work with them. You know, it would be like our little family. The Lord said that we should join together in companies of two and three and all of that. So we go, prior to going there, there was some certain little signs that I saw and I spoke to an individual who also was supposed to have been going there. And based on, you know, their input, I said, okay, maybe it's just me being sensitive me. I've always been told that I'm sensitive me. So I said, okay, it's me and my sensitivity. So I overlooked it and I continued on that road. So we ended up going to their property. After being there for a while, we noticed that nothing was happening on our property. So we were there in June. June comes and it ends. July comes. If you're not in the Northern Hemisphere, you may not be aware of that. Our weather here is a little bit more challenging because you have almost eight months where it's very cold. So you can only work between, say, June to maybe early September. 
yeah, you could push it, but it's an older person, and I wouldn't push him to be working um, outside of September. Not that I was pushing him anyways. But, yeah, so we go there, nothing is happening. So I decided that, you know what, I'm going to ask the lady if I could get the person's number, because she keeps telling me, he says, next week, next week, next week. And yes, of course, when you're dealing with a friend, they will always be, as we say in Jamaica, posting you. But when you're dealing with the person paying you, you're a little bit more, you know, upcoming with information. So uh, when I asked for the information, I was on the road. She sent me the information. When I got there, she basically confronted me. Have you called him? So I said, no, but I'm going to call him. Shortly thereafter, she comes over because at this point we are in a little RV thing on her property. She comes over, she hands me the plan that they drew for us and the contact numbers for the individuals who are participating in the process and says that she won't be helping me. So at this point, I'm like, okay, because she's the one in charge and I shouldn't be overstepping myself and all of that. And I was like, okay, then. So I said, okay, we'll just leave. So I went, I called a friend and a friend said, sure, come up, you can stay with us, blah, blah, blah. Which I was very happy for these people. The friends who said I could come have always been so supportive of us. So we intended to go there. The next day, I was tending my little garden because I'd gotten a little area where I could put my stuff. And I was just watering it. She comes out. She begins to challenge me if I'm going to leave. I can't leave my stuff here and I can't send people to buy my stuff from her. And, you know, she was getting very loud. Very, very loud. And, um... They can't help me. I'm afraid of snakes. And the lady started to like literally beat me down. And I'm a bolly bolly person. So I started crying. And then my children are in the RV and they hear this woman shouting at me. So they decided, I think I need to go help mommy. <laughs> so at this point, I'm like saying to her, um, you're much older than me. You're even maybe older than my mom. So I'm not going to argue with you. Not to mention, I don't know you that well. Why would I argue with you? So I walked away from her and, you know, like at that moment, the person who was supposed to clear the land called. So now this is where I'm like, okay, this must be God saying, go ahead. You know, when you just want to do something, you know, take everything as a sign. So I said, it must be God saying to go ahead. So I went, I spoke to my friend. My friend said, no, don't do it. Then I'm like, but again, I don't want to owe anybody anything. I don't want to be a burden to anybody. That that word burden is like a trigger word for me because I heard it a lot during my marriage, being a burden to somebody. So I don't want to be a burden to anybody. I'd rather die on the street than ask somebody for a piece of bread. That's like where I'm at. So to think that I'm going to go to somebody's home and they're always wondering, is she going to pay us? What is she going to do? Not me. So I said, okay, I went, I spoke to the man. <clears throat> I looked at my options. I have two kids. I don't want my kids to be a burden to anybody either. Um, just a little side story here. When I had my first child, at the age of three, he could wash his clothes. He could cook for himself. He knew how to make his bed. He knew how to brush his teeth and take a shower. Why? Because I always had this inclination, I'm just going to drop dead and he's going to be left and he's going to get a stepmother. He's going to beat him and treat him badly. So at least if he's less obvious to her because he can help himself, he won't be a burden. So that's just my twisted way of thinking. So that's who I have been and that's my circumstances that makes me that person. Based on what I've seen growing up with other people. I've never had to really endure it, but I've seen it. So, coming back to the story, a whole lot of things happen, and I won't go into it because I don't want this to be too long. I really just want to get to the points of what I've learned from the experience. So, we finally ended up with much, much, much heartache, ending up on our property. So, we're sitting on our property. Again, another wait period. Nothing is being done. It's an older gentleman, and I'm like, is this man going to drop dead? The man is like, he moves like very slow, very, very slow. Um, they say it's because he's meticulous, 
But I think it's also because he was much older and he would come, he'd do two hours and then he'd go, it's too hot because he comes like at 10. So by 12 o'clock he goes. So one day we wake up and I'm like, God, what is happening here? Because we can't live in this thing. By this point, the other tenants in the camper are telling us that we need to leave. Yeah, we had rats, like seriously. And it was scary. So the other tenants were telling us that we needed to leave. And we woke up and there was this other man there. He came over with the original people. And we were so happy because, you know, he looked younger and more capable. But then we realized he wasn't that capable. He needed the guy to tell him everything that he needed to do. But he was younger. So he was the bronze while the other man was the brain. So finally, we get a floor. We get the well dug. We have water pouring out, waiting on the water to clear, and we have a floor. So we're feeling excited. Then we notice that a week pass, nobody turns up. It's beginning to rain because when it is not snowing in New Brunswick, they have long periods of rain. The man can't come, he's sick, nothing can be done. Now, Alongside that challenge, I ended up with some other personal challenges, read the children, and that just, let me tell you, just flipped me upside down. You know, there are cases where you have situations where you said, it must get better, can't get worse, has to get better. And especially when you have people that you have been dealing with for a long time, and you've been praying for them, maybe a selfish prayer, but you have been praying. So you think, it must get better. Yeah, the optimism died, like it was shot, dragged out in the bush and burned. Yeah, it died. And I realized that things were getting much worse and not better. And the lady was getting very aggressive in her attitude. There was an incident with the kids and she came over and she started to verbally attack my children. And, you know, I'm always like, yeah, they're boys. They really need to get a little tough love sometimes. And especially if it's not coming from mommy, it's good because then they really get to see what the real world was. But she was like going at them and even attacking the baby. And I'm like, uh, this is where we stop. No, you don't attack my children. You can talk to them and tell them that, you know, you don't appreciate something that they did. And then I realized that she had been telling a lot of lies about the children, like serious lies to this new fellow that had come. And I'm like, what is the benefit to this person of doing that? And she had also been telling stories about me to other people. And I was like, I don't get this. You're a Christian. So this really turned my world upside down. So fast forward, I'm not going to go through all of that. Because as I said, it's about the experience of a person. So all of this, I decided to sever ties with them, which came at a very timely moment. And the decision now needed to be made. Where are we going to stay? Because the intent had been that we would have been in our own place by this. And, you know, we would have just spent the winter trying to do our part in terms of putting up the drywall and whatever. So that didn't work out. Um, some friends offered for us to stay at their place, which was very nice. Um, it was an, it's a nice family. Um, we have gotten very used to them. They helped us when we first came down here. And But I didn't want to be around anybody. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to see, hear, or be around anybody, which didn't really work out when I ended up going to Jamaica because now I had to see my brother and talk to my brother and take care of his baby. But that was different because he didn't know the fullness of everything that had happened. So he wasn't like, you know, spot checking, are you okay? It was more like he would just share his day and, you know, you could just be distracted with his life and his doings, which was good. And then the baby was a little blessing too because, you know, babies are cute. So we went, we decided, okay, I'm going to go to Jamaica. The intent was only to be there for a week because I'm still thinking I need to go back. I need to start deciding, should I sell the property? Should I try and buy land? And it's always this go, 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 go. And this is what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Just going. So I go there. My other brother who is in New York says, we're coming to Jamaica and it would be nice if I could see you and the boys. I want to talk to you guys, you know, da, 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 da. And then my mom says that she's coming too because the baby's birthday was in February. So I said, okay, we're going to stay till February. 
So we stayed till February. So we were supposed to return. Um, then we got news that it wouldn't be good to come back because the winter was really bad and you know it was you know affecting the people here so we'd have really been more of a burden to them than a blessing to them so we said okay we'll stay so we ended up having to change that which was another expense that wasn't planned for but in the end it worked out because it was nice not to have to come back in the snow so nice so we stayed okay we were there going around and I remember having a conversation with my brother when I just got there and when he said it it was like exactly what was in my heart he said you we were going to visit an acquaintance of mine and he said I said can you go by the person's house he said I'm not going by the person's house because one this area is not the safest area it's not like a bad area but they were presently in like a lockdown because of some incidents that had happened around the area and he says, I'm not going. I'm just going to the gas station. So if you can't meet you there, I'm not going. So I said, um, they're Christian people. You don't have to worry. Like, even worse, the fact that you tell me that they're Christian made me even want to turn back the car. I don't deal with Christians. He does cars. He's like, if somebody tells me that they're Christian, I'm like, I don't want to do business with you. And when he said that, I'm like, that was what was in my heart based on my experience recently with this person. So that was my experience. And when I spoke to the young lady yesterday, she was sharing similar experiences that she has had with other so-called Seventh-day Adventists. Now, I make no judgment on anybody and their walk with God. I just look at what experience I've had with you and what it has taught me. So I'm going to share with you, oops, my notes are behind. So seven things that I have learned, and I wanted to read something from, it's a quote from this book. It is from, it's Manuscript Releases, Volume 3, page 427. So it says, how did he, which is Jesus, always respond to problems? It says, Christ never murmured, never uttered discontent, displeasure, or resentment. He was never disheartened, discouraged, ruffled, or fretted. He was patient, calm, and self-possessed under the most exciting and trying circumstances. All his works were performed with a great, with a quiet dignity and ease. Whatever commotion was around him, applause did not elate him. He feared not the threats of his enemies. He moved amid the world of excitement, of violence, and crime. As the sun moves above the clouds, human passions and commotions and trials were beneath him. He sailed like the sun above them all, yet he was not indifferent to the woes of men. His heart was never touched with the sufferings and necessities of his brethren. Sorry, was ever touched with the sufferings and necessities of his brethren, as though he himself was the one afflicted. He had a calm inward joy, a peace which was serene. His will was ever swallowed up in the will of his father. Not my will, but thine be done, was heard from his tail and quivering lips. So I believe personally, and I'm only speaking for me, I cannot speak for anybody else but me, nor can I qualify what I have come to learn from me to anybody else. You will interpret it your way and that's okay. So I believe that all of my experiences serve one purpose. They are to show me who I am. Just as I told you my peculiarities in my thoughts about my children or myself being a burden, that's who I am. Now, whether it reflects God perfectly is where I must be most concerned. Not with what others think of me because I will never please another person. I've come to learn that quite, quite distinctly. So here are the seven things quickly. That one, I should take nothing personal. I'm just going to share the verses. I won't read them. So Zechariah 13, 6. Jesus speaks about the wound that he received in the house of a friend. And in Matthew 25, he says, Whatsoever you do to the least of these, they do it unto me. Whatsoever anybody does to me, 
they're actually doing it to my father. And he has allowed it for his purpose. So the same thing goes that whatsoever I do to anybody else, I'm doing it to him. So my concern should be, what am I doing to another person? When I look at my life and the experiences that I've had, and even with my kids and their father, my greatest regret is not what has happened on his side, but what has happened on mine. The things that I've said and the things that I've done, and whether or not I reflected Christ fully to him or to my children or to anybody else who saw what was happening. So that is where I am at now. I try and I trust God to help me not to take anything personal. The next thing is my experiences are my best teachers. Someone once said that your worst enemies are your best teachers because they show you exactly what is inside of you. And that's where yeah, Deuteronomy 8, 5, and 2, you can look at those verses. Number three, do not put my trust in man. And that was one of the things that God showed me. Even when God was providing for me, I was still seeking help from other people. Part of what attracted me to these individuals was, as I said, I'd become so weary. It was nice to have somebody else think for me and act for me and tell me what to do. But no, do not put your trust in other people. Whether they are doing things with the wrong intent, even when they're doing it with the best of intent, your trust should actually be just in Christ. And, you know, more than once throughout this whole experience, I heard people say to me, maybe you had too high expectations. And they were exactly right. Because my expectations should only be in the Lord. And that's Psalm 62, 5. And this one that I already had done a little bit. <laughs> oh, no man, anything but to love them. Romans 13, 8. You know, sometimes as a single person, you get caught up in this, um, oh, help her. She's a single mother. No. Mm -mm. don't don't swing that God is your provider and God is your husband and to be honest you don't need titles of God being your husband or your father well yeah I'll take the father you just need to recognize that he's always with you and he'll never leave you and as I said we spent a lot of time rushing 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 we have to get the country home we have to get it up to this scratch we have to get the food in we have to do this we have to do that God has shown me that there are times to be still. Psalms 46, 10. There are times to just be still. Even since I've been back, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. And I don't want to just do because I think I have to do. I want to leave it and let God tell me what he wants me to do. Then let the loudest voice be that of God. You and your circumstances are different than me and my circumstances. I can share my experience, but I can't tell you what to do. My dynamics are different. I have three kids, an adult, two small children. You may have a husband, whatever. So me talking into your experience must be weighed against what is God saying. You can't make anybody else's um, voice be louder than God. And I, even your own. So that's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And then this one was very key, very, very key. It says, and this is one that I reflected on throughout my whole time in Jamaica. What a man says is truly a reflection of their heart. And we know this, you know, I think it's Proverbs where it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the man speak it. Our first meeting with this lady, first face-to-face -face meeting, she began to... Um, speak about one of the local MPs or whatever they call the municipal officers in this country. And she began to just, you know, denigrate and, you know, she was just going at the person. I was like, it was odd that she would have this conversation because one, we just met. Two, I don't know that person. And three, the thing that she was making an issue about was like, who, who really cares? It's not all that big a deal. It was like, they had some wooden stakes in the ground, like just sticks, and they would just tie like the markers for the trails on it to indicate the path for the snow removal. 
And she was like, why couldn't they make something better? And the man couldn't even explain why they did that instead of doing what everybody else does using the reflecting sticks. And she was just going on and on. And the thought that came to me, I just blurted it out to my kids as we went into the car, was what will we have to do for her to talk about us like that with somebody? I just said that just off the top of my head that day. And I lived to see it. And as it is true for her, it is also true for me. When I sit with anyone and I beat down on anybody else and call names and give details, because as I said, this is not about the person, because I've forgiven that person, prayed for her and her husband, and the whole situation was actually a blessing to me, because it really showed me a lot of things that are still in need of lots of prayer to be purged from myself. But if I continue to spew my bitterness out to the world, I'm a bitter person. You know, um, I love this book, The Law of Life, because he has a thought that came to me many years ago. He doesn't say it like this, but this is how God gave it to me. A lot of my feelings are manufactured. Sometimes you will sit back and you'll have an experience and you really don't need to respond to it. But because you know it is almost expected that you respond to it, you respond to it. He tells that we should take nothing personally because everything that is done is done to God. It's not done to you. And God not just allows it, but God wants you to have that nobility of character to just stand still and let that person see him work in you. It says, I'm not personally hurt by others' response to my love because I'm not dependent upon them. I'm dependent upon God. And what they do with the gift is their problem, a reflection of their own heart, not mine. And besides, it wasn't my gift anyway. It came from God. So for me, the days of manufacturing my supposed hurts and all of that are over. Whatever has happened to me, God has allowed it. And I do believe that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. I believe that no good thing will he withhold from me. I believe as well that what the devil meant for my harm, he will use for my good. And that what he has planned for me is far more than I could ever ask or think. So I hope whatever was said was not um, a bunch of ramblings on an early morning. That something there will be a blessing to the hearer. And I pray that God will, you know, direct you as he has been directing me. And the last thing I'd like to share is that over the last couple of weeks, one of the things he has been definitely, you know, indicating to me is the need for reverence. And that's what I'm studying now with my children. Reverencing not just the Sabbath, but reverencing every action throughout the day, every time you eat. You know, that whole verse about whatsoever you do, whatsoever you eat or drink, do it all to the honor and glory. God. It's all about reverence. As well as in Joel, where he talks about he will restore to you what the canker worm and the palm worm has stolen. Many people use that in relation to their everyday life. Oh, my marriage will restore it and all of that. And that may be true. But if you read the verses before and the verses after, it's talking about the outpouring of his spirit. So he wants to restore in you for him that desire for his Holy Spirit so that you may be equipped and work. Okay, I'm 42 years old. I'll be 43 in a couple of months. And when I look back at my life, there has been a lot of canker worms and palm worms. Moments where I should have been working wholeheartedly for the Lord, even within my home with my children where I was not. So that is my desire for him to restore, to redeem the time with them and in my working for him. And I pray that Whoever else hears this will also have that experience and that desire because it is on us to hasten the coming. It is not the next nuclear bomb to drop or the starvation that is projected, but rather, do I look like him? Do I sound like him? Remember, at the end of the day, his desire is to see Christ in us, the hope of glory. So have a good day.